Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. My message has a strange title today. I've set it up kind of like an algebra formula. One F in parentheses plus one F in parentheses equals AP. One F plus one F equals AP. We're going to look at a little spiritual algebra today. Amen. Matthew chapter 18 verses 19 and 20. And the word of God today reads from the King James text. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of of them. Amen. That's all we're reading today for our primary text. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, Savior of lost mankind, lover of men's souls, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, it is in the preaching of the Word of God where faith is built and established and disseminated throughout the church. For the Word of God declares faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Help us, O oh God, today to preach this message you've laid upon my heart in a manner, Lord, that will bring glory to your name, that will strengthen your church, that will encourage your people, and inspire us, O oh God, to higher heights and deeper depths in you than we have ever before known. King Jesus, bless the ears, the heart, the hearing of every individual that would see and hear this message online. By reason of the internet, let the anointing today, O oh God, flow like a mighty river. Let it work as a mighty hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. O oh God, let hardened hearts today be softened. Let minds that are sold out to wrong thinking today, O oh God, be delivered. And let them establish this hour right thinking. That we all together as the people of God might experience the fullness of your blessing in our lives. We ask all this in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Praise God. Amen and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. One if plus one if equals a P. We're looking at some spiritual algebra today. One person with faith plus one person with faith equals answered prayer. Hallelujah! One person with faith plus one person with faith. Notice it's not one plus one equals a P. It's not just about getting two people together. But the Word of God said if two will agree as touching any one thing, if you can get two people to agree, now listen carefully to me now because a lot of preachers aren't going to tell you all this today. If two believers can agree, one, that what you would ask of God is the will of God. Oh my goodness. Well, brother, when somebody asks me to help them pray about something, I just pray about it blindly. I just immediately pray with them. I don't. 
I get prayer requests all of the time online from people. Oh, please pray that John uh, Fredder will finally look at me and fall in love with me. Honey, this is the church. This is not witchcraft. We're Christians. We are not practitioners of the occult. If this thing isn't about God brainwashing people and God forcing people to do what you want done, how do you know that person's even the will of God for you? I had a lady in our church a few years back. Boy, howdy, I'll tell you what. She was in a lousy, terrible, horrible relationship. It was a mess. She was constantly coming to me rapping and groaning about this person she was in a relationship with. You remember, Booby? Oh, but it's God's will that we be together. I know, and oh, if I heard her say that once, I heard her say it a thousand. But I know it's God's will that we be together. I know it's God's will. I know it's God's will. Until it wasn't. Then the preacher had to rent a U-Haul and help her move out of that bad situation. It wasn't a week later. She had found somebody else, and I tell the truth. And within two weeks, she's wearing a ring and they're claiming to be all engaged and she's telling me how they're planning on moving in together and, and I'm looking at her and my head is swimming. I'm saying, you've got to be out of your bloody mind. You were just in a terrible situation, a very messed up situation. You were convinced beyond the reasonable doubt. You spent more of your time trying to convince me and anybody else who would listen to you that that was the will of God for you. You got out of that and you're no sooner out of that than you're into another mess and you're claiming it's God's will and you know it's God and blah, 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 blah and there's trouble on the horizon. And then she asked me, Oh, Pastor, do you think it's a good idea if so-and-so and I move in together? We were at a a church function, a, a fellowship function. And I guess she figured she had me cornered because we were in a public place and surely the pastor's not going to speak his mind and embarrass me in a public place with all these other saints from the church being around. Well, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but honey, I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you think you're going to back this boy into a corner so that I won't speak my mind, you don't know me very well. And so I said, you know what? You really don't want me to answer that question. I said, let's just leave it alone. You don't want... I tried, didn't I? I tried, I tried, I tried. I said, don't ask me that question and I won't give you an answer and everything will be well with the world. Oh no, I really want to know. And boy, she just kept pushing. And she kept pushing. So finally I said, okay, you want to know the answer? I do not think it's a good idea. I think just a couple weeks ago you were in a bad situation and I had to help you get out of that situation. You were no sooner out of that one than you're into a new one and then you're jumping into, oh, I've got a ring, we're engaged, we're going to move in together. I said, no, I'm sorry, but I don't think that's a good idea. She sat there looking like a deer in the headlights. All of a sudden she wasn't coming to church anymore. All of a sudden, we weren't seeing her in church services. Folks, my point is this. Too many people want to believe that the will of God for their life is what they want the will of God for their life to be. I get nervous about people who claim to A, always know the will of God, and B, who claim to always be walking in the perfect will of God. I get nervous about those people that do those two things, and I tell them the truth. Honey, if you always know the will of God, 
then you're right up there with Jesus. And if you're always walking in the perfect will of God, then you're right up there with Jesus. Your flesh never gets in the way. Your flesh never jumps ahead of God and decides it wants to do something on its own. Uh, I'm sorry, I've been preaching the gospel for decades and my flesh still jumps ahead of me sometimes. I still get my eyes set on something that is not the will of God for me. I'm not telling the truth. But that's why when I pray, I always pray, Lord, if it be your will. Why would you pray that way, Pastor? Isn't prayer supposed to be about convincing God to do things your way? No. Prayer is supposed to be about helping you to align yourself with God's way. That's what prayer is supposed to be about. Oh, really? Where in Scripture does it say that? Oh, well, I'll tell you what. It says it when Jesus said, By the way, when you pray, here's how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Oh, I'm not praying for a Mercedes. I'm not praying for a Rolls. I'm not praying for a Bentley. I'm praying for the kingdom of God. I'm praying for lost souls. I'm praying for the backslidden. I'm praying for the end of this age so that the fullness of God's kingdom can be realized. That's what I'm praying for. But what are the next words? Thy will be done. When we think about prayer, very seldom do most Christians even contemplate for one moment when they think about prayer, the will of God. Very few believers even contemplate that. But the Word of God said, where two of you agree is touching any one thing, but what must we agree upon? Well, first of all, we've got to agree it's the will of God, that number one. You see, God is not stupid. The Word of God said, Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Therefore, you should be able to find one other person who is able to confirm your thoughts concerning a matter, if you're so convinced it's the will of God, then God willing, there's a saint in the church who feels the same way about it. Hello now. Oh, but pastor, no, 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 no. I don't have to run my decisions past another believer. I don't have to run my decisions across uh, another saint in order to know what's the will of God for my life. Um, let me tell you a little secret. The United States of America is built upon a constitution that was written in such a way so as to provide three branches of government. Those three independent, co-equal branches of government provide for one another a system of checks and balances. Guess what? God is not foolish. God knows that we as human beings require checks and balances. This is why the Lord says, if two of you shall agree. Ah! Oh, now I get it, Lord. You're putting me in check. There's got to be a check. There's got to be agreement. There's got to be consensus. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I remember when I found a young lady back in the uh, 1980s, and I was so desperate to get married, I thought that would fix all my ills and all my problems would be solved. And I had a devil of a time trying to find a girl that would give me the time of day. Finally found one. She gave me the time of day. Boy, she acted like she was nuts about me. I went up to uh, Shamrock, Texas, where my friend, Sister Bruce, and her husband were pastoring. And I went up there and I told her, I said, I, I think I found the girl I'm going to marry. Glory to God. While I'm here, I'm going to be praying about it. And Sister Bruce looked at the girl's picture. I showed her a picture of this gal. 
And Sister Bruce looked at me and said, Chuck, she's not the one. Wow. Well, great, Sister Bruce, if, if I'm trying to ask you to help me pray that this girl will say yes and this girl will marry me. If I'm trying to ask you to help me pray, I'm not going to get any agreement here, am I? Do you follow what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you something. To this day, I honor and I respect and I admire Sister Bruce. She knew what she felt in her spirit. She knows what God showed her in her spirit. And she knew I was going down the wrong path. I went to prayer. During the course of the time, I was preaching in Shamrock. And every night I'm praying, Lord, please, God, uh, is this the right girl for me? Is this the right girl for me? And the answer came back clear as shooting. No. But Lord, you know I need a woman to fix me. I need a woman to help me. Oh God, I need a woman. I need a woman. Lord, is this the right woman for me? And I'm just trying to convince God of the storm. And the answer comes back, no. I talked to Sister Bruce about it. Sister Bruce says, Chuck, that's not the girl for you. That is not the right girl for you. You are going to open a can of worms that you ain't going to like once you've opened it if you get married to that girl. She never met her. Never met her. Didn't know anything about her. I didn't have any agreement there. I didn't have any consensus there. I went back to Fort Worth. I proposed to this girl. She agreed to marry me. I was so excited. Long story short, we got married. She was attached to her mother at the hip. And I mean, her mother said jump and she said how high. This I never saw people that were so attached a mother that she was adopted she was not a blood daughter she was adopted and she was a little to be frank on the simple-minded side and she just let her mother control everything she did she didn't work a job by herself she worked with her mother everything was her mother her mother her mother long story short a month passed one day I wake up after the wedding, a month after the wedding I wake up and the girl I married is nowhere to be found. We have not even, not to be personal, but we have not even consummated our relationship yet because she was terrified of intimacy. So, you know, under the circumstances I was okay, no problem, <laughs> that's alright. Hadn't even consummated, there, there was no quote honeymoon night in our marriage. She was gone, had disappeared. And all of a sudden I'm being told, well, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have let her get married. She's too young. She's not ready. She's too naive. And next thing you know, we're going to the courthouse and my marriage is being, is being uh, brought to a halt. I was married a month, folks. Never consummated my marriage. And from that day forward, I was a divorcee. The mother claimed that the union could not be nullified, that they, they couldn't just get the marriage nullified, which I'll never understand why. And we literally wound up divorced. Well, guess what? I could no longer ever be an ordained minister in the Church of God. I could be a licensed minister, but I could never be ordained because I was divorced. If I ever remarried, I would have no possibility of being ordained. Every girl I ever talked to after that didn't want to know nothing about me. Because why? Because I was divorced. And in the Pentecostal Church, the only thing worse than being divorced is being gay. So... You're, you're not on good footing. And boy, I mean, I jumped out of the frying pan right into the fire. Messed my life up. Messed everything up. Sister Bruce tried to tell me. We all ought to have people in our lives in the church that we hold in high esteem and whose input is of great importance to us and who we trust to hear from God. I'm going to tell you, a lot of times it's easier for somebody else to hear from the Lord for you than it is for you to hear from the Lord for you. Because you've got all your passions and you've got all your thoughts and ideas and all your goals and 
you've got all kinds of issues in your flesh that are working against your spirit. The Bible said that the flesh wars against the spirit. So I mean, generally speaking, the flesh is giving you a devil of a time. And a lot of times, your friends in the faith, you know, your mother in Zion, as we used to call an older person, an older woman in the church, who'd kind of take you under her arm and spiritually nurture you. We call them mothers in Zion, or our father in Zion, you know, a, a man who would take you under his wing. But you'll have somebody that you trust and that you go to them and, and when you need prayer and when you need God to help you understand His will for your life, there's somebody you really trust and admire and appreciate and you know they can hear from God on your behalf. We all ought to have that. That's part of the reason why you can't make it without the church and the church can't make it without you. If you think living out there watching church online and watching church on television affords you all the benefits of being part of the fellowship of God's kingdom, you are so diluted. You are so foolish to believe such trash. No, you need the church. You need to have people. Now, not everybody in the church, you don't look at everybody in the church the same way. There are some people there that, to be honest, you have very little confidence in them. You don't have a lot of confidence in their prayers. You don't have a lot of confidence. Either they're worldly, or they're carnally minded, or they're distracted, or maybe they're just young in the faith and they haven't really established themselves. But we all generally have people in the church that we do admire and we do appreciate whose prayers we do covet. Am I telling the truth today? One person with faith plus one person with faith equals answered prayer. I go to people in the church that I know, number one, know how to pray, and number two, that can agree with me on a certain matter. But the first thing we really need to agree upon is whether or not this is even the will of God. If I come to somebody and I say, oh, agree with that. And I knew a lady in the church I was part of many years ago who did this exact thing. Pray with me that God is going to make me the winner of Publishers Clearinghouse. Literally, this woman said. I mean, how stupid is this, right? How many people across the world are praying that God's going to let them be the winner of Publishers Clearinghouse? Why is God going to make you the winner when there's only a million people asking Him for the same exact thing? I'm tired of being poor. Tired of being broke all the time. Uh, what you need is a good mature saint of God who knows the Word of God who can look at you and say, Honey, the Word of God says they that would be rich fall into a snare. Am I telling the truth? You need somebody to remind you of what the Word of God said. Uh, it's not the will of God to pray for riches. It's not the will of God to pray for millions. It's not the will of God. You're, that prayer, you ain't going to hear that prayer agreed with for me. Because it contradicts the Word of God and therefore it is contrary to the will of God. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? So the first thing we must come into agreement concerning is, is it the will of God for you? Secondly, is it within God's purview? In other words, can God do it? Now I ask that question and immediately people say, well of course God can do it. God can do anything. The Word of God said, nothing shall be impossible for God. That is true. But not everybody believes that. Amen. Not everybody believes that. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I know people, uh, I know Christian people who have some of the funniest prejudices and some of the goofiest ideas in their head. I know Christian people who believe God can heal cancer, God can heal this, God can heal that, God can heal everything there is to heal. 
But let a gay person come in and say they've got AIDS, and guess what? All of a sudden, God is no longer in the healing business. Their prejudice jumps in the way. Oh no, if you brought AIDS upon yourself, honey, there, there ain't no healing for that. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? You see, you've got to be in agreement with somebody. You've got to have somebody who has faith. You've got to be with somebody who agrees that what you're seeking is within the will of God for your life. And number two, that what you're asking for is something God can and will do. Not everybody you talk to is going to believe that. I remember one time being so heartbroken. Man, I struggled and struggled as a young preacher. I was single. I just knew if I could find a wife that that was going to fix me and all the issues I was struggling with and all the issues I was wrestling with were going to be solved and fixed. And oh, I just knew if I could find a wife. And I went to this one lady in the church who was, oh, the most spiritual woman in the Riverside Church of God. I mean to tell you, she was right up there with Jesus. She was just high hair, holiness, long sleeve, long dresses. Oh, sister so, I'm not going to name her name. But sister so-and-so, bless God. You, and I loved her and I loved her husband. But I always had a feeling she wasn't too keen on me. But... You know, I felt, well, maybe that's just me. So I tried. One day I was so heartbroken and heart sick over being alone and lonely and just struggling. And I went to their home. And I knocked on their door and she answered. And I was in tears. And I said, could you all help me pray, please? Could you please help me pray? I'm just praying that God will help me find the right woman for me, and that the Lord will help me. I said, I, you know, I'm just struggling, and I really need you to help me pray. Oh, okay. And she and her husband, bless their hearts, went straight to their knees in their living room, and I joined them, and we started praying together, and they prayed with me. And when we were all done talking, this dear, sweet, kind, considerate sister said to me, well, you know, Chuck, what you need to do is just go out and get you a steady job and just, you know, start making a good living and stuff because that's what girls are looking for. That's what young ladies are impressed by. And, blah, blah, blah. and she starts talking like this. And I thought to myself, the pastor had a grandson who was a preacher and he wasn't too much older than me. There was a young man from... Riverside Church, who today is the general overseer of the Church of God. And he grew up in Riverside Church, God of Fort Worth. He was not that much older than me. And I thought, I wonder if Sister So-and-So would have told either one of them in their young days that that's what they needed to do, was find a good job. And Oh no, because they were called to preach. They were called to minister. Well, so was I. And I knew it. And I was trying to establish my ministry, and I was preaching. I had invitations all over the place to preach. I was constantly preaching at that point. And by then, you know, the, my ministry had kind of gotten on a roll. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, now, isn't it funny? I asked her, and her husband, if they'd agree with me in prayer, but were we in agreement? No, we were not. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Oh no, she believed God could establish this young man's ministry and help him find a wife within ministry. She believed God could help this young man and establish him with a wife within ministry. Oh, but Chuck, no, he needs to go find a job somewhere. This woman literally was acting like there was no call on my life, that there was no ministry for me. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Folks, you better be careful who you ask to pray with you and to pray for you. Because just because they say, yes, I'll pray with you, does not mean they're in agreement with you. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? It does not mean that they believe what you're asking God for is within. And mind you, I was not asking the Lord, you know, make this girl say or make that one, you know. We, no, I would just say and pray that the Lord will help me to find the right one. I couldn't even get her to agree with me on that. 
Modern Christianity has followed a very dangerous path today. Many have been led by false teachers and false prophets within the contemporary church to believe that Christianity, similar to the heretical Gnosticism of the second century, is a faith of mysteries and secrets. They try to tell you that Oh, you know, there's a secret to God answering prayer. There's a secret to this. There's a secret to that. Oh, God revealed it. If I had a nickel for every time I saw a preacher on television come out with this baloney line, God's revealed to me the secret to answer prayer. You want to pray and be effective and have God answer your prayer? God showed me the secret to effective prayer. You're a liar from the pit of hell. There is no secret. There is no mystery to this. The Lord has told us again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. There is no secret. There is no mystery. I don't need you to dig up some crazy scheme to help God answer my prayer because God's sitting in heaven saying, I'm not going to answer your prayer until you discover this little hidden gem that I've tucked away somewhere. Folks, it doesn't work that way. And you'd better be careful of leaders who try to establish themselves as the disseminators of mysteries. They claim that God unveils gradually. He reveals gradually to His people, usually through these same false teachers, these same false prophets, these same organizations. But the truth is this. The Christian faith is a simple faith. Nothing about Christianity is difficult to understand or impossible to grasp even by the lowliest and simplest minded of believers. The Bible said the way of truth so simple that a fool need not err therein. The Word of God says the way of truth literally is so simple that a simple minded person can get it. It's not that hard to get. But see, we've had preachers and prophets and organizations, false prophets, who have complicated it and turned it into something it is not. And they've tried to suggest that God has all these secrets and all these mysteries that usually you need them to help uncover and reveal. One prevailing thought within the church is that there are secrets to prayer and prayer being answered. False prophets seize upon the rampant, listen to me children, they seize upon the rampant lack of faith within the church today to suggest that the reasons for unanswered prayer lie within the fact that you just haven't yet learned the secret. You just haven't yet found this mystery. But we possess today through the Word of God certain promises. And those promises are very easily accessed and very easily realized. Our God has made nothing about serving Him and living for Him and walking with Him in the fullness of His blessing and His power. He has not made it complicated. He's kept it simple. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, the Word of God says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Doesn't sound to me like there's a bunch of mysteries. Doesn't sound to me like there's a bunch of secrets that God's hidden. And we're out there like a bunch of kids on... Uh, Easter afternoon trying to hunt up eggs and find where God has hidden them. It doesn't sound to me like that's the case. No, the promises of God are simple and easy to understand. Matthew 17 verse 20 And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, 
For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Well, the Lord just answered two questions. He just answered, uh, what will we not be able to accomplish if we have faith? Nothing. And what is the one thing that will prevent you from realizing those things that you're claiming to believe God for? Lack of faith. Period. Not whether or not you're wearing a prayer shawl. Not whether or not you pray in a closet. Not whether or not you do things this way or you do things that way. Or whether you pray these words. Or whether you read this prayer from the Word of God that someone in antiquity once prayed. No! There are no secrets. There are no mysteries. It's laid out bare for us. The Lord said there were things His disciples couldn't do. And He laid the blame right at unbelief said, Lord, why couldn't we do it? He said, because of your unbelief, period. He didn't say, well, you weren't wearing your prayer shawl. There's a whole movement in the charismatic church today where people are running around believing that God answers prayer better if you wear a prayer shawl like the Jews did in uh, olden times. If you pull a, uh, what amounts to a... Uh, scarf over your head, you know, as you pray. Folks, it's stupidity. And yet there are millions of Christians who follow after this. No, Jesus said, it don't take a whole lot of faith to get things done. It takes very little to get things done. Therefore, if it takes very little faith to get major things done, then the only thing that prevents you from getting it done is what? The lack of faith. Period! End of story! Well, I guess that shuts down a lot of TV preachers with their great mysteries and their great revelations about what it takes to get prayer answered. What it takes is faith is what it takes. And if you get faith working in agreement between two or more people, it's a done deal. As long as you can get them to agree, is this the will of God for me? Is it the will of God that I should be asking for such a thing, period? And is it within God's purview? Can God do it? And remember I said, just because people know how to pray doesn't mean they necessarily believe that God is able or willing to do for you. They might believe God's willing to do that for them and never believe He's willing to do it for you. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Luke 17, verse 6. The Word of God said, Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And the Lord said, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. No, there's no great mystery as to how to achieve answered prayer. Answered prayer is simple. One person with faith plus one person with faith equals answered prayer. In James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, the Word of God tells us, Ye lust, meaning ye desire, and have not. So you desire, but you do not possess. Ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not. Why? Because ye ask not. One of the biggest reasons people don't see more miracles in their lives is, listen to me children, is because their lack of faith, it all boils down to lack of faith. Their lack of faith prevents them from asking. When I was a kid, I was terrified of my father. My father scared the life out of me. My mother will tell you. If she left the room, I mean, I jumped up and followed her out of the room. I was terrified to be in the same room with my father. He scared the life out of me. If I went to my mother and I said, Mom, I need lunch money this week at school. 
And my mother said, I don't have any money. Go ask your father. Guess what? I went to school that week and did not eat lunch. I'm not kidding, folks. God is my eternal witness. Because you couldn't pay me enough money to go ask my father for anything. I didn't believe my father would give me nothing. Every, most of the time I asked him anything, he wasn't interested in giving me anything. So I had no confidence my father was going to give me nothing. So if mom told me she didn't have it, as far as I was concerned, that meant it wasn't available. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? I never asked for it. Now, he may have given it to me, as hateful and as nasty as he was. He might have given me the lunch money. I don't know. I'll never know why. I never asked. Do you follow what I'm telling you? A lot of people are so fearful and they're so full of unbelief that they never even bother to go to God. So many people are full of anxiety that they run around like a jingle with their head chopped off every time something happens. And not for one minute do they ever think and stop in their tracks and say, Lord, can you help me in this? When I lost that money this week, I stopped and I said, Lord, can you please help me? I don't understand what in the world I did with it. I don't know. Maybe I miscounted to begin with. I don't know. I, I, I just don't know what's going on. But Lord, can you help me with this? I believe God can help me. I believe God will help me. But you know what? If what my desired re reaction, my desired response doesn't come about, it's not because God didn't answer my prayer. It's because God has something different that He's doing. I don't know what it is, but all things work together for good to them that love God. So I know all right, Lord, you've chosen so far not to let me find. Now, you know what may happen? I don't know. I'm just saying. What may happen? I may go two years, and all of a sudden, the need will come up that requires $600. And all of a sudden, I'm going to reach into a pair of pants that I had, and I'm going to find that money sitting in, that, in those pockets. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or uh, that money, all of a sudden, I'm going to find it over here. I'm going to find it over there. I'm going to say, no, wait a minute. I looked there. I, saw, I looked at that very spot a dozen times. Tommy and I, a while back, we were living in our other house. And I misplaced a check. You remember that movie when I, this check disappeared on me? I couldn't find this check anywhere. I looked and looked and looked. And finally, Tommy said, well, why don't we pray about it? Yeah, Tommy said that. Can you imagine? So we sat down on the bed. He and I took hands and we prayed. I said, Lord, please help me find it. And then when I got done praying, I said, all right, I'm going to bed. Tommy said, well, aren't you going to keep looking? I said, no, because I've asked the Lord to help me find it. I said, uh, I don't need to keep looking at this point. It's in God's hands. You remember that? The next morning I woke up and the first thought in my mind, the first thought in my mind, pull out the end table next to the bed, the nightstand. It'll be on the floor behind the nightstand. Folks, I got a little secret for you. I'd already looked there. I'd looked there several times. But that morning, the first thought come to my mind was pull out the nightstand, it'll be on the floor. I pulled out the nightstand and there it was, laid up against the wall. Now, maybe I looked before and somehow or another I, I didn't notice it laying against the wall. But the point is, that morning, the thought come to me just as clear as a bell. Pull out the night, it's going to be sitting right there. So when I pulled out the nightstand, I was fully expecting it to be there. I was fully expecting to see it. And I did. You see, you asked God for help. He gave me the help I asked for. If for any reason you don't get what you're asking for, then you might consider that for the moment, for the moment, it's outside of the will of God. God has another plan. He is working something else. The Word of God says ye have not because ye ask not. But listen now to verse number 3. James chapter 4. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your own lusts. So sometimes you don't get an answer to your prayer because what you're asking for is asinine. 
It's based on your own carnal desires. It has nothing to do with the will of God for you whatsoever. You just want it because you want it. And you think God is a waiter with a towel over his arm, just standing there waiting to give you every little thing you ever ask him for. Well, but the Word of God said, if two or more agree, it's touching any one thing. Well, the problem is, if you get two morons who are both asking for the same stupid thing, you ain't going to get it any faster than you will, oh my God, am I telling the truth, than if you have two spiritual people asking for the same thing. It's not going to make any difference. If you're asking amiss, you're still asking amiss. You better remember when it comes to prayer that the will of God is the most important element. In 1 John 5, 13 through 15, almost done today. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything for words according to His will. If we ask anything according to His will. He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. One person with faith plus one person with faith equals answered prayer. Can we agree on a couple of things, sister so-and-so? Can we agree on a couple of things? Can we agree, number one, that this is scriptural, that what I'm asking for is scriptural. Number two, can we agree that what I'm asking for specifically is the will of God? If I'm asking for a car so I can get to and from work, that would fall within the parameters of, and my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But if I'm asking for a Rolls Royce, Hello now. Honey, you couldn't afford to maintain a Rolls Royce. You couldn't afford to change it all in a Rolls Royce. A Rolls Royce would be a curse to you, not a blessing. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? So it's all about the will of God. Is what you're asking. Are you asking, are you framing your request in the right manner? Are you praying for God to send you a helpmate, a spouse, or are you praying to turn Johnny Wonderful over there uh, into a slave so that he'll fall for you and find love with you when he couldn't find it for anybody else? Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Folks, one person with faith plus one person with faith equals answered prayer. In the end, it all boils down to this simple passage of Scripture, Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If your priorities are right, and the will of God and the kingdom of God. Remember what I said when the Lord gave us an example of prayer. What were the two things highest on the list? What were the two things at the beginning of the prayer? The kingdom of God and the will of God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We start out with praise and thanksgiving. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So our prayer life ought to reflect the will of God and it ought to first and foremost reflect a concern for the kingdom of God and that includes how the kingdom of God manifests itself in our lives which is what we call righteousness. Amen. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. If we're seeking first and foremost the kingdom of God, we're not just seeking for an expansion of the kingdom for more souls to be saved and more people to come into the church, but we're also praying and asking God to help us to be more worthy of His kingdom. Amen? Amen. To look more like citizens of heaven, although we're sojourners on earth. Oh, I want to tell you today, there's only one equation you ever need to know. It's only one formula that you ever need to understand when it comes to answered prayer. It's not complicated. It's not a mystery. It's not a secret. It's simple. The Lord has laid it out for us simply. One person with faith plus one person with faith equals answered prayer. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I actually today thought ahead a little bit. And I thought at the end of the service today I'd like for us to sing this chorus and it's, it speaks of the truth that I've just spoken of today. Amen. Let's sing that song to the Lord and then we'll close for the word of prayer. <laughs> if two of you or three agree concern Anything if you will come and ask as one in my name, it shall be done, it shall be done. It shall be done in my name. It shall be done. Hallelujah. If two of you or three agree concerning anything, If you will come and ask as one in my name, it shall be done. It shall be done. It shall be done in my name. It shall be done. It shall be done. It shall be done in my name. It shall be done. It shall be done. It shall be done. If two of you or three agree concerning anything, if you will come and ask as one in my name, it shall be done. It shall be done. It shall be done in my name. It shall be done. It shall be.
Yeah. 